We were so looking forward to this segment about finding joy in detachment. And it goes along uh, absolutely with what uh, Dave was sharing with the word of the day, with the gospel message. But Adam, there's a lot to be said on this topic and how to approach it practically. We, we can go to the saints, many great saints, uh, like St. Saint Francis of Assisi, St. Teresa of Avila, and, and others, um, because they practiced and, and actually preached on letting go, letting go of all the worldly things so that you can really focus on God. Would you like to begin, Adam? Sure, Deb. So there's a few interesting points. I wanted to start by going over just a few points about the story of the rich man and the camel and the eye of the needle that might help us here. So at the time of Jesus, amongst many of the Jews, wealth you know, having money was seen as a sign of God's approval for somebody's behavior in life and their adherence to the, to the law, God's law. And the rich were seen as being blessed by God, and so they were the likeliest to attain heaven. Now, this wasn't everybody believing this, but this was a pretty common belief. And so you'll, you'll see hints of this in other parts of the gospel where people that are poor, or destitute or sickly are seen as not being blessed by God because of some fault. And so Jesus is countering this idea that worldly attainment, worldly wealth is God's approval and that's therefore what we should strive for in this life. So he's doing something in very stark contrast and when we understand that that was the, uh, you know, that was the normal take on things, the, the rich young man who walks away sad because he, he feels he can't give up his money makes a little more sense um, because he was probably of that mindset that he was giving up heaven if he was giving up his things. Now, of course, you know, the apostles gave up basically everything they walked away from, their jobs, their security, um, you know, the communities that they were living in to travel with Jesus. So there was also a big contrast there. You've got these guys standing there with Jesus who, who have given up everything and Jesus refers to, you know, don't take anything with you and you're going to just trust in God's providence. And they're really buying into this. And so this was a kind of a critical moment where Jesus was showing a contrast between the normal take on worldly security and wealth and what the apostles were buying into and, and really investing themselves into. Now, the other point about this whole story is that it's not saying that wealth is bad necessarily. It's not saying that everybody should just give away everything and then God's going to be happy with you. You know, Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, it will be hard for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say impossible, but he says hard. So, What's the answer to that? What is, what, what's the way to enter the kingdom if you do have security? Well, I think it's what you touched on at the opening, Deb, and that is our attitude towards it. You know, the attitude of the young man who was wealthy was that my wealth is the blessing of God that gets me into heaven. My wealth and security is equated with my salvation. And we see that that's not the right attitude. And Jesus amplifies this when he says, you know, as, as Dave mentioned, for human beings it's not possible, but for God everything is possible. So we are saved by God, not by our own efforts. Our own efforts are often linked to our wealth and security in life. And finally, Deb, the final point on, on this story I wanted to touch on, the USCCB gives us a little bit of commentary on the eye of the needle because it's something that a lot of people like to to comment on or wonder about. So their commentary are, riches are an obstacle to entering the kingdom that cannot be overcome by human power. The comparison with the impossibility of a camel's passing through the eye of a needle should not be mitigated by such suppositions as that the eye of a needle means a lower narrow gate. So this is in reference to, you know, it's oft repeated that there was a there was a low and narrow gate in Jerusalem that was used usually in the evenings that the merchants, when they would bring goods in on their camels, the camels couldn't get through with, with all the packs and goods on them. They would have to unload them 
get the camel through and then carry the bags through separately. Archaeologically, we're not completely sure that that gate ever really existed. And what the USCCB here is saying is that we need to focus on the themes in the actual story as opposed mm -hmm. to what exactly what gate he was talking about. Right. Well, and that's where it gets into this for us as we go through life to constantly, I think, practice this, this I call it the art of detachment, where we, we really um, um, take, take an, um, a kind of a, we do a self-assessment, if you will, of where we're at um, with the world and where we're at with God. And how, how tightly are we holding on to God and how tightly are we holding on to the material things? And we, if we practice letting go on, a, and even in small ways, right, letting go of these things in order to free up the room to really um, heighten our, our, um, uh, cl our uh, focus and attachment to God, that's a good thing. And, it, and it's something that can be done in, in small ways, but in, in a daily practice, so that it is very freeing. It's very liberating. Now, you're absolutely spot on, Adam. We need to um, get through life. We need to pay our bills. We need to have, you know, savings in the, in the bank. We need to do all these things and, and, and take care of our neighbor by, by um, you know, contributing to things or, and tithing at the church and all sorts of things. Absolutely. But it's this idea, I think, on, on our mindset towards these material, these material goods and, and uh, riches that I think is, is what, is what um, it's calling us to a higher level of how we look at things and how we um, um, enter into relationship with things. Because I, I know I've been practicing, I was sharing with Keith earlier before we started this show this morning, I've been, Marty and I have been practicing being minimalists for a, uh, about a year and a half now. And boy, oh boy, is it so freeing. I love it. I mean, to the point, and I never thought I could be like that ever because I'm a person that always saves something and says, I, I might need this, you know, 10 years down the road or, you know, and, and I got, you know, all this stuff that is so outdated because I'm, I'm thinking, well, you never know if you need, if you need, need this item and then, and then you can't find it in the store. But I'll tell you what, when you let go and really free up that space and let God just come in. Boy, does he come in in, in miraculous and abundant ways. I, I, I've seen it in my own life. Marty, Marty and I have seen it. What do you think about all that, practicing it on a daily basis in small ways? And it's not about, I agree with you, it, there's nothing wrong with, with um, working hard and, and being compensated and receiving those things um, that, that allow, allow you to have more um, you know, luxuries or some more, you know, advantage in some way when it comes to being able to buy something or purchase something. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's really has to do with the way we look at it and the way we enter into relationship with it. What do you say to that? Yeah. In, in graduate school, um, in psychology, one of the things we learned that was quite interesting when we were, you know, in training to be therapists and, and there's been, you know, real research on this, Subjective happiness in life, actually, in terms of wealth and worldly goods, does not change at all once you get above the poverty level. So if you can get your basic needs met, and yeah, literally just that, your basic needs, you know, needs like, you know, housing and food that's reasonable, and, you know, you're able to pay your bills, Subjective happiness doesn't increase as you go up brackets in wealth. Um, and we see, I think, some evidence of this in that people that start pursuing money and gaining money, they never stop wanting more because there's this feeling or thought that if I get more, I'll be more happy. But the data shows that you actually aren't. You end up chasing this ephemeral thing that you can never catch because your subjective happiness doesn't increase with more wealth. Sure, there's some unique, unusual experiences that very few people get to have with a lot of wealth, but there's only so much you can do in the world. Eventually, it, it, it all gets old. And yeah, so that's one piece. Another thing, Deb, and maybe, you know, Maybe we could continue this on the other side. I know we have a few minutes. Another way to transform our relationship with wealth and 
you know, worldly means is to see them as gods as opposed to ours. So, for instance, if we go back to Joseph of Arimathea, one of the disciples of Jesus, he was a wealthy man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he used his power and wealth to get the body of Jesus from the Romans and then place the body of Jesus in his own dignified tomb. If there hadn't been somebody of wealth and means and political influence to do that, that process wouldn't likely have happened. Now, mm -hmm. God can do whatever he wishes, but God used Joseph of Arimathea, right. who did have wealth. And so that's another way to transform it is to say, well, what does God want me to do with all of this? Because exactly. it's his ultimately anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use it for the good, use it. Because if you, if you have the means and you can step in and, um, and, and make a difference um, for, for the kingdom, it really, it's, it, it, it's your opportunity. It's, it's, it, it becomes a great gift to you because you can, you can show how much you're, you're willing to, to give that over in order to, to help others. Um, and, and just like you're sharing with, with, with um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, I totally agree. Mary Magdalene as well. You know, the, the many, many biblical scholars have said that she funded um, uh, Jesus's ministry. So people of means can do great things. I, it's funny, Adam, let, on the other side of the break, let's talk about this because we're coming up to um, fall pledge drive season. And that's where Catholic radio stations across the country are trying to raise the necessary funds to get through the fall months and into the winter. And it's so interesting that you're talking about this because this is what I talk about when I help to host um, pledge drives is, is this idea that if everybody doing their part, every pledge is a perfect pledge. And, and if people just, you know, give their, their particular 100%, it can go a long way. And God, God just, it, it's so amazing how God works it out in the end. It's, it's incredible when everybody steps up and that, but that requires the, the intention and the mindset to want to, uh, give, uh, to, to build up the body of Christ and build and, and, and build the kingdom. So Adam, we're going to hold it right there because Keith has some important announcements. When we come back, uh, let's talk about this. Cause I think it's really important. I think, I think especially we're, we're in an election year and people are getting nervous. They're not sure what's going to happen in the next couple of months or the next couple of years, but we don't want to, we don't want to go into that fear mode. We really need to go into the God mode. I love how you said, Adam, that it's, it's all gods. I, I so agree with that. I think about that all the time in the ministry work that we do that it's all gods you know people will say sometimes had what does it feel like to do ministry you know do you like your ministry it's not my ministry it's it's gods i mean it's everything is gods and it's so interesting when you when you adopt that mindset and that attitude it does allow you to uh, participate in a way that is much bigger than self, right? It's much, it's much more than just the person. But just going back real quickly, Adam, what I shared before the break about we're coming up on fall pledge drive season for uh, Catholic um, affiliates, Catholic stations across the country. It's so true. You know, when I go on air um, at, on pledge drives and I, and I share with people that, you know, the goal is, you know, $5,000 and, and people say, well, Okay, so how are we going to get there? Well, we need a we need a couple people at a hundred dollars, a couple people at five hundred dollars. We need somebody to pop in a a thousand or twelve hundred dollar pledge, or even somebody who can do a five thousand dollar pledge. And people will say to me all the time, you know, Debbie, why do you why do you go for that bigger that bigger money? And I'm like, you have we have to we we're, we all have to give our our best pledge, and every pledge is a perfect pledge. So for me, Adam, my hundred dollars that's what I can do. Okay, and so. I, I think that's great. I, I throw that into the bucket. So that's great. And, and somebody else will throw in that, um, you know, thousand dollars. And that is fantastic. They added a, one more zero to it. And that's, that's great because they, they can do that. And that's wonderful. But it takes, it takes everybody coming together and doing their part. If one person steps away, whether it's the person at $10, $100, or $1,000, or $10,000, or $100,000, there's, there's something missing there. 
And that's what I, I like to tap into all the time, Adam, and I know you're going to speak more about this, but just this idea that God wants us to participate. He wants us to cooperate. We are a family. That's why when folks listen to Take Two with Jerry and Debbie, I'm constantly saying we are a family, the Take Two family. What do you say to all of that, Adam? Because I, I'm very big on that because I think when people step out or they sit on the sidelines or they're just in the observing mode, they're missing out on an awesome opportunity to demonstrate to God that we are we definitely take the body of Christ seriously. Yeah, you know, this whole discussion made me think of, of the poor widow at the temple. So, you know, we, we see in uh, Luke 21 at the beginning of, of chapter 21 there, When he looked up, he saw some wealthy people putting their offerings into the treasury, and he noticed a poor widow putting in two small coins. He said, I tell you truly, this poor widow put in more than all the rest, for those others have all made offerings from their surplus wealth, but she from her poverty has offered her whole livelihood. So it's very clear here that, you know, God sees us and our actions in life, whether it's a kindness to a stranger helping them cross the street, whether it's a donation to something, whether, you know, it's, it's some work we do pro bono for, for some good cause, whatever it is, God sees us in the context of our lives, not compared to other people. So yeah, it's, it's all his in the end. And I'm not saying that, you know, we should give away everything and make ourselves destitute. The body of Christ should be healthy. Absolutely. Um, The vine needs to be healthy. Otherwise, it doesn't continue to produce fruit in all the various ways, the most important of which is spiritual. But all of these readings today in this discussion are about not getting caught up in the blind pursuit of wealth for ourselves. Because again, it's all his. In the end, as we approach the end of life, we all face that realization that we didn't create ourselves. We can't extend our life. But in the end, it's everything is going back. We're not taking anything with us from the world. We're taking to our judgment the good that we did, the sins that we haven't repented of, and we're going into a spiritual reality, not a worldly one. So Yes, work hard. Yes, if God blesses you with surplus, that's okay. But just remember that it's his and don't get caught up in it and make it an idol, make it a little God that you pursue thinking it's going to make you happy because this is just secular psychology has long ago figured out through studies that it's an endless pursuit. You'll be on, you'll be on that, um, that little wheel running like a rat in a cage, thinking that you're going to be healthy if you just run a little further, but the wealth in the end doesn't bring happiness. Mm. So, you know, hmm. it's it's good and pursue it for the good that can be done with it. But yeah, be careful of attachment because it, it can be a real trap. Well, and anybody can feel that attachment at any level. I mean, it, you don't need, you can be, you know, not, not so not so wealthy, all the way up to the the very, 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 the very top richest uh, folks in the whole entire world. You can, it's that, that attachment is, you know, the world is telling you one thing, Adam. And so you buy into it, right? I need, I need this. I better save this. I better have this. I better accumulate this. I better make sure there's enough for me, you know? And, And so the world is constantly, it's like this drumbeat of, of constant, uh, you know, scaring folks into that mindset. So I, wouldn't you say too, that it's, it doesn't really even matter what level anybody's at, right? Um, uh, it's really this idea of, of elevating out of that, getting out of the world and really focusing on God and saying, okay, God will provide. I mean, look at, look at the, the, our father in so many of our prayers how it's a, how it's a, a affirming that God will provide and that we need to trust. So it goes back to trust. It goes back to letting go and, and, and letting God take care of everything and trusting God. I mean, there's so many, there's so many aspects of this that, that is, is for the spiritual development of the soul. What do you say to that before we close? Yeah, I would just like to close, you know, with the famous story people have probably heard before that Mother Angelica, when mm-hmm. she built the EWTN Global Television and Radio network, and I'm sure it has many other aspects to it. She built all that on Providence. That's right. 
you know, she it wasn't that she was a, a wealthy heiress who had, you know, billions of dollars to, to build this global network. Mm -hmm. And that famous story that, that is oft repeated that day that they were going to be installing one of the big TV transmitters. And she simply prayed and said, look, God, you told me to do this. I don't have the money. You know, you need to provide it. Mm -hmm. And trusted that he would. And at the last minute, phone call came in and somebody on a yacht somewhere just felt moved to contact her and make a donation that was right in line with what they needed. Yeah. So, you know, trusting in Providence is a very real thing. St. Francis is a place to go for, you know, a great model mm -hmm. for trusting Providence. Mother Angelica. Absolutely. To, to see what she did through God's providence. So. Well, well, and you look at Mother Teresa, too, and her ministry work all around the world. I mean, it was the wealthy that stepped up and really helped her in, in, in to, to push that along. And so, I, I mean, I, it goes back to this idea, if we, if we all just participate, if we all just cooperate as best we can, it'll work out because we are the body of Christ. What do you say? Amen? Amen. And it's okay if you have a lot, if you're Joseph of Arimathea, that's okay too. And if you just have the basics, that's fine. God is mm -hmm. going to work with us all and he's got a plan and that plan is heaven.